Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And welcome to Talking with Teachers. I'm your host, Dr. Abdullah bin Hamid Ali. And today we have another special guest, Dr. Uh, Tamara Gray, Sheikh Tamara Gray, the founder of Rabata. Uh, and before bringing her on, I wanted to just read uh, a condensed version of her bio. She, of course, is, uh, has a very extensive bio and a lot of experience. But Dr. Tamara, Tamara Gray is founder and executive director of Rabata, an organization dedicated to promoting positive cultural change through creative educational experiences. She holds a doctorate in leadership from the University of St. Thomas and master's degree in curriculum theory and instruction from Temple University. And she spent 20 years studying traditional and Islamic or classical Islamic sciences, the Quran and Arabic in Damascus, Syria. She worked in the field of education for 25 years before moving into the nonprofit world. In addition to her work at Rabatha, she sits on the Collegeville Institute's Interreligious Fellows Program, serves as both faculty and an academic counselor member, council member for the Islamic Seminary of America, teaches at the United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities, and is a senior fellow at the Yaqeen Institute. She has recently joined the Fifth Council of North America as well. She is a mother of three, grandmother of two, and an avid reader and lover of cultures, people, coffee, and food, as she would say. Uh, so we like to welcome Dr. Sheikha Tamar Gray. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Thank you for being with us today. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, mashallah, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, to spend with us to offer us some wisdom about with relationship to your your working experience. Um, it, the thing was interesting. I just wanted to mention this before I actually asked you my first uh, question: is that like what I actually didn't know until early when I was reading through your bio that you spent some time in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is my hometown. So, and oh. you set you you studied at Temple University. I also studied at Temple University back in the 90s. I actually was majoring in uh, computer science. And <laughs> so, so it's sort of strange how I end up where I am right now, you know, in, in some regards. You know, but I was, I was somewhat running from Islamic uh, studies. And then I sort of found my way back while I was there. I discovered the Arabic section of the library. And so I started to fall behind in my computer science studies. You know? So, well, mashallah. It's well, I was there in the 90s as well. So who knows? Imagine if we sort of passed each other <laughs> at some point and didn't know about it. Yeah, yeah, Allah. Subhanallah, subhanallah. Yeah, yeah. Subhanallah. That's a small world, I guess you say. It's like to say. But the first question I really want to ask you is something that I ask all my guests. And uh, it's a simple question of who is Tamara, Tamara Gray? Who is Tamara Gray? Uh, and fundamentally, of course, that's a question about you know, your, your family background, your journey to Islam, your journey to the study of Islam, things like that, you know. So what uh, would you like to share? <laughs> well, uh, subhanAllah, this question, who is Tamara Gray? It's, I used to think about it a lot because when you live in another country, people ask you this question, you have to answer it in a second language. So I, I used to like work on in my in my thoughts. What are the easy sentences? What can I say that will answer that question mm -hmm. quickly? But I've been back here now for about 10 years. And I think that as you age, the way you define yourself or even remember what made you who you are changes a little bit. And so back in the day, I used to really emphasize four strands mm -hmm. that brought me to where I am. And I think I would I would add a fifth now, which is good because I like what to. Mm -hmm. But um, so these four strands are, first of all, I was raised in, I'm a, I come from a very typical suburban uh, 1970s background. And what that means is that my parents were divorced. I lived in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. I was, um, uh, what else does that mean? I, I was very, I was like, you know, the extracurricular activities and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And Second, it means, and I now second is I was a Christian. I was a practicing Christian. Hmm. I grew up a practicing Christian much more than the rest of the people in my family. Oh, okay. So I, I was like a devoted Christian, you might say. I was even a little bit, I was pretty young, but I was a little bit on the um, missionary type, missionary brain, <laughs> missionary brain. You know, I was the one who once in a while who would say to that person eating ice cream, are you, are you saved? 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but I mean, that actually informed my, my journey. So it's important to mention it. Mm -hmm. And then I also was very much involved in the theater. And the reason mm -hmm. I mentioned that is because subhanAllah, like that experience in the theater and things like this gave me a lot of confidence in front of people. Mm. I didn't have hesitance about going in front of people with anything. I mean, I, I started speaking early on after I became Muslim. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth one is I was raised in a house in the seventies in a household where my mother was very much interested in the feminist movement. And the word feminism in our community is such a scary word today, but back in the day, yeah. the feminism mm -hmm. was really about, um, it was about, well, my manifestation of it, it was about equal pay for equal pay for equal work. Mm -hmm. And it was also the 80s, the early, early 80s was there was a brand new movement, which was against sexual harassment in the workplace. Right. So those two things are really important to me. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that also influences my journey. So those mm -hmm. four things. And I think that brought me to the place of where I was able to convert those four things. So how the being raised as a suburban white girl um, meant that I wanted to get out of there. Like I was dying, dying to get out of suburbia. Mm -hmm. And it was a whole thing in my head. But then I applied for a university that was close by. So I ended up going to a local university, McAllister, very good school. And I was really blessed. I had a full scholarship. So my stress about money, I was able to kind of put that aside mm -hmm. and go to university, which was really a blessing. Yeah. Uh, second, coming from this Christian background, the summer before I went to university, I had a my my sort of feminism and Christianity mixed, mm -hmm. and I no longer I felt I no longer felt comfortable worshiping a man, like as in a human man, right? Yeah. And I was really struggling. And remember, I'm a very religious Christian mm -hmm. at this time, mm -hmm. so I'm I struggled with my own lack of faith, my own doubts, my mm. own struggle. And at the same time, I was struggling with the idea of, which of course now we all know, I mean, of course you should struggle with that. But right. at the time I was struggling with the idea that I'm worshiping a human being. Mm -hmm. as a man. So that summer I struggled a lot and I still did all my Christian things. I was still at the camp. I was still um, mentoring younger people and mm -hmm. things like this. But by the time I got to university in the fall, I was still seven, I was 17 when I went to university. Mm -hmm. By the time I got to university in the fall, I was a mess, a, a spiritual, theological mess. I wanted to solve it. I like to solve problems. And so I, oh, I forgot to mention, I mentioned the theater piece. There's another piece I usually mention. So I'll just make that five. You can always add another one. Mm -hmm. I was really interested in, brain stuff. Like I love to read. I was a really good student. I was um, interested in, in thinking and philosophy and religion and all this kind of stuff. So I thought I'm going to solve my problem through uh, my brain. Right. So mm -hmm. I signed up for a couple of classes. After three weeks, I couldn't be Christian anymore. And then I launched my, uh, you know, proverbial search. And I became Muslim January of that year. So the mm -hmm. next year, of course, with that school year. And when becoming Muslim, the piece that I said I've mentioned about theater and also Christian, all of it together really kind of mixes mm -hmm. up, is when I was becoming Muslim, I read the Quran. I didn't read the whole thing, but I read, and uh, uh, so I opened it actually to Surah Al Ahzab, in the Muslim, in Muslim, this verse. And I was so taken by it. And I was taken and, and really kind of overwhelmed. Mm. And I said to myself, SubhanAllah, well, I didn't say SubhanAllah at that time, but something. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is this religion has a real place for women. Mm. And I said, Oh, too bad the Muslims don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then that's third, one. <laughs> I mean, that was my, you know, then the third yeah. piece was in my head was, oh, it's okay. They, they need someone to teach them. Yeah. Which of course I thought was me. I wasn't even Muslim yet. <laughs> Just so my, like, too much uh, confidence mm -hmm. in all of that. But that's, that's because of all those pieces that came mm -hmm. with me. 
Mm -hmm. um, then I started on the path of Islam was 1985. It was a very difficult time to be a Muslim woman in the United States at that time. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I looked for my, my, like, I thought, okay, I'm going to solve this with Ilam. Now, this was pre-Google. I didn't mm -hmm. learn about Islam on Google or on internet. I, I didn't actually learn much about Islam before, before becoming mm -hmm. Muslim. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to learn and I got connected with a woman uh, in California at the time. May Allah reward her immensely and continuously and Amen. to the end of times, inshallah, mm -hmm. and beyond, beyond the end of times. <laughs> I mean, and um, so she was the first, the first Muslim that I had spoken to who made logical sense to me. Mm. And that's the, who was grounded in Dean. Let me put it that way. The right. first Muslim who I spoke to was grounded in Dean. Mm -hmm who made sense and was speaking spirituality. I remember I was a religious person. Mm -hmm. So coming into Islam and then finding like this sort of mess that I found in the beginning, right. lack of resources, difficulty with resources, people I was meeting were not able to help me understand, like sort of grab onto this religion that I believed was there. Uh, so she really helped me a lot with that. And um, she was Syrian. So I decided that I wanted to take part in the Syrian experience. Mm -hmm. And the little joke I usually tell is at that time, it was really easy to get a passport if you married someone from here. <laughs> so as a brand new Muslim who was wearing hijab, I every other day I had some country asking for me to marry them because it was no <laughs> country, just one individual. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so I, I, I sort, I felt like, I, you know, oh, well, I have some options of the countries I'd like to marry into. And so mm -hmm. I, I decided I wanted to marry someone from Syria, mm -hmm. and I did. And so we got married, and we had, we got married, and you know, that's a whole other life journey, isn't mm -hmm. it? You get married, you have children and all of this. And we intended to go back to Syria, but it took a while for us to both intend it together. <laughs> um, and finally, alhamdulillah, after my second daughter was born, we decided, we, we went back. We, we were going to just give it a try. And we lived there for 20 years until the war in 2012. I had a third child there, uh, my son. And I loved it with every cell of my being. I really loved living there. It was um, a wonderful place for a Muslim woman during the 90s. It was a place, to, it was like the place to be. I had opportunity and I had uh, options and I was, because I was immersed in society, I was able to learn Arabic, uh, mm -hmm. study. I had help uh, to support my endeavor mm -hmm. and um, yeah, then 2012, I came back to the United States. Un it wasn't my plan. It was Allah's plan. Right. Allah for Allah's plan. But certainly, mm -hmm. if you had asked me in 2012, how do I think feel about moving back to America, I would have laughed at you. I was mm -hmm. absolutely not my plan. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, at that point then, to begin bringing you all up to today here, maybe mm -hmm. I'm going on too long. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I think it's good for the audience as well, right, to hear yeah. your story. So at that point in 2012, when I got back, I actually needed a job. Like I needed to work for money. You know, I needed to live. Um, and my husband had gone to Scotland for a two month doc post doctorate appointment, which is great, but two months wasn't enough. And so we, my family is here in Minnesota. So we had, uh -huh. my son and I had come back here. Uh -huh. He was the only one who was young enough to still be traveling with me at the time. Uh -huh. And so I didn't know what to do with myself. I tried to apply for a job. I couldn't get one. Applications for jobs were so different than they had been. When I left, I could do stuff online. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know anyone. And so I remember the day that I literally, I started sitting in this, I was in a little yellow house in West St. Paul, right next door to my brother and rental, of course. And I remember thinking, okay, well, I can't, I was grieving, I was grieving the loss of my life before. I, well, mm -hmm. you can't do anything about what's happening in Syria. Right. It, it was, it, it's your pain, it's your grief, you can carry it with you, but you can't do anything about it, mm -hmm. talking to myself. But you can take what Syria gave you right. 
and you can give that back to the Muslim women here in the West and, and globally, even with this new tool that I had discovered coming to America, mm -hmm. internet. <laughs> and so that's where, that's what I did. Like I, that's where I poured all of that grief energy and poured any other energy I had into building Rabata and the work of Rabata. And then I went back to school. That was at my husband's advice. God bless him because it was good advice. Mm -hmm. I went back to school and got my doctorate, which was a really good sort of roundup of my studies. I had been far a long time away from Western, the Western um, system. Yeah, right. And so it helped me in a multitude of ways, not just the doctor itself, not just the, mm -hmm. the research, but also just the understanding of how things are working nowadays and, mm -hmm. and getting caught up on theory and getting caught up on all sorts of things. Right, right. Yeah. Well, getting, well, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. I mean, and the reason I like to ask that question is that, um, I think it does two things uh, for uh, listeners is that um, one, of course, it gives you some background, general background about their teachers, you know, like, you know, what sort of um, journey they had, you know, and so it's, it's informative in one sense, but in another way, it's, it actually helps to, I think, increase understanding uh, in the sense that there's no person we know who we agree with a hundred percent of you know of the time right the thing that they that they say they do you know or or their ideas you know we don't all see eye to eye on every single thing but i do think when you actually hear the person's story and who they encountered and you hear who their teachers were uh it helps one to understand okay what went into that particular opinion, that yeah. particular idea, that particular statement that they made, right? And and my hope is that the more that we do understand one another's stories, that it will, um, you know, promote a bit more tolerance and compassion, right, towards other people. I was having this conversation like mm -hmm. a couple of days ago. I actually did, I interviewed interviewed uh, Dr. Abdullah Quick, and I'll preserve him. Um, you know, and we were talking about this, the importance of elders and respecting the elders and, and seeing, uh, um, you know, what their experiences were. Right. And and then after that, I also had an interview with Imam Dawood Walid and we were talking about Imam Warthadine Muhammad and certain viewpoints that he had that which people felt were controversial. You know, but I do think in, in the process of speaking about him and others like him, all the people like yourself as well that I do think that it, it helps, you know, people who actually are trying to be reasonable, I guess you would say, people trying to be reasonable and understanding to really just connect a bit better, right, with um, those those around us, right? So, um, so yeah, yeah, that's that's what that's why I think is awesome. really important, right, you know, so, and I would say before I even go into ask you another question is that one thing I do appreciate about, about yourself is that, that, you know, Unlike a lot of people, right, that I've come across, you know, who are in the realm of Islamic teaching, um, I find a lot of people, and again, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, stereotype anyone, you know, but but there, there there's too many people I consider to be a bit pretentious. Uh, you don't come off as a pretentious person to me, right? You're, you're very, uh, you're very open, like you know that you 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 be very genuine about you know how you feel about things, you know. And of course, that can get people in trouble at times when you're just too open, right? You know, so it's like, oh, well, what's going on here, right? But but it's, I, I do think that that's what Allah demands of us to be honest with everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, we can work through misunderstandings, right? You know, but I do think that it's an important characteristic for any teacher to have um, is to be. Uh, just honest and 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 just be, be just genuine, right? With everyone they interact with. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I'm I certainly, yeah. I just appreciate that. Thank you very <laughs> much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so you said you grew grew up as you know this sort of missionary you know, little Christian girl and and uh, you know but you you mentioned you said that okay your family uh, other members of your family may have not been taking Christianity as seriously seriously as yourself. Um, you know, but but would you say that like your family generally were like religious, you know, you know, just you happen to be a bit more <laughs> religious than others? <laughs> yeah. uh, my father, the joke is my father used to go to the church of Sunday football. OK, OK. So yeah. <laughs> my mother, I think she all I think back in the day, she really was a a deeply religious person, but she wasn't very vocal about it. Mm -hmm. 
she was definitely the one who took us to church. Mm -hmm. And as a child, she had been involved in Christian mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. But she wasn't uh, very vocal about those inner feelings mm -hmm. and those inner thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. And she has been always very mm -hmm. accepting of me. So mm -hmm. th the sort of type of Christianity where you're very, very oh. sort of extreme, mm -hmm. it's really tough to accept a child becoming a Muslim because that really crosses against their hope for the Akhirah. Mm -hmm. So my mother has always been very supportive of me as my father has too. And so I would say that, no, I didn't come from a, a, your mm -hmm. typical sort of definition of religious family. Mm -hmm. They were more just middle class, um, struggling to get along, wanting to be the sort of typical, I'm an American, I'm a Christian, good person kind of people, not the mm -hmm. more uh, attached to a particular denomination or something like that yeah right right but what, what also resonates with me from what you said was the fact that you had encountered muslims who were um i guess you could probably a probably good way to describe it would be sort of muslims who embodied embodied islam you know that once you encountered muslim embodied islam you know yeah. and it was more than just like that superficial um you know focus on the mechanics of each particular pillar of islam you know, and those ideas and the details, you know, that that in itself is what really sort of touched you. Um, and, and it, it brought, to, brought them to mind um, years ago. Now, now I was raised Muslim. My, my, my parents, they came through the nation of Islam, you know, but, but, you know, they didn't know a whole lot about, well, my mother, I would say, you know, that my mother wasn't as serious in her studies of Islam as my father was. Uh, you know, but I remember I used to try to convince my mother to read certain books. I would always give her books that were related to like the five pillars, as a cod, things like that. And she would never comment, you know, until one day I gave her a book, uh, Purification of the Soul. That was the only book that I gave to her. She said, you know, that was a good book, right? You know, so in other mm -hmm. words, it's like people wanted more than just the dry yeah. sort of, you know, um, mechanical uh practice of religion right you know 100 mm -hmm. right so 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 why don't you speak tell us about rabatha i mean what is it about how did it you know how did how did it come 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 about and and you know yeah yeah so when i got back when i came in 2012 mm -hmm. to the united states mm -hmm. i thought i was coming for five months i told my job actually i said listen I'll, i'm gonna be late i was working as academic director of a school Mm -hmm. And I said, listen, I'm going to be back late for the start of the school year. You're just going to have to start without me. Mm -hmm. I'll be back in October, which is the biggest joke ever, because here I'm still in those five months, mm -hmm. 10 years on. Mm -hmm. But uh, 11, 11, subhanAllah, it will be 11. It mm -hmm. is 11. Anyway, so when I came back in 2012, mm -hmm. I was in my, we went that, that summer, it was Ramadan, I was staying with my mother still, like my parents. I hadn't rented the little yellow house yet, or I hadn't decided to. And Ramadan was coming, and my students, so I had had some students that were here in America that had come to Syria, and they said, listen, you're here, let's do a tour, let's introduce you to other Muslim women. And I said, okay, and I said, let's do it in Ramadan. Don't even, I mean, I don't even know what I was thinking, but I know what I was thinking. I was thinking, ah, do I really want to be like at my mom's house in Ramadan, when my mother, God bless her, supportive, but always worried about drinking water until today, mm -hmm. over to the water police. <laughs> so I went out, so I went in Ramadan and I went to 69 cities, spoke in 69 cities and met Muslim women mm -hmm. all over the United States. Mm -hmm. I was really surprised to see the status, or not the status, the state of Muslim women in the United States. I had been gone for 20 years and I, my expectation is that the, this, the, 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 well, the, the education, the confidence in Dean, the feeling towards religion would have changed yeah. drastically in those 20 years. And I found zero change Same. from when I left in 1991 mm -hmm. or 92 or whatever the year was that I left. Mm -hmm. And so I was really, a, I was grieving that. And so when I, the that fall, uh, we had already had in place a little, like Mary Masul, uh, one of my students, and she's an awesome human being, she had already had this idea of having a little organization to help me come back and forth from Syria so that I could come and teach people to retreats. But now when the war started and after I had done that, that retreat, excuse me, that tour, mm -hmm. and I came back, 
I was facing this whole thing. So I told you earlier, I said to myself, you can give what Syria gave you. Yeah. And so that was the, the catapult or that was the, that was where, where we started. Rebelta. Okay. I can do this. And we started with a pilot class, an online class. I'd never done anything online before. I was catching up, I was running to catch up with everybody else's real digital experiences, which I had zero. Mm -hmm. And I had done, when I say never, I mean, it's not never. I had done a couple of things. We got Facebook like in the last six months in Syria and things mm -hmm. like this, but nothing like those of you here who really knew how to manage and navigate mm -hmm. uh, the internet. So we started with that first class and then uh, I kept, we kept thinking like this, I really was serious about the idea of positive cultural change, meaning helping Muslim women grow in community and be able to have confidence in their faith, yeah. mm -hmm. feel solid in it, no matter the external influence. I can't tell you the women I've met over the years mm -hmm. who their religion goes up and down based on the people around them, whether it's a husband mm -hmm. or a parent or a sibling or a friend. And I, I did. I wanted to change that. I wanted women to be able to be confident in their faith, comfortable mm -hmm. in who they are, be able to hold the identity of Islam, if you will, strongly without um, any sense of bitterness or anger or frustration, mm -hmm. etc. Right. And I also wanted to help them taste the spiritual life of this beautiful faith. Mm -hmm. So uh, we. I, that's so. Every project was built on that idea. So we started with the online Ribat program. Then we went into publishing. Then we went into having a small space in Minnesota. And then we uh, began other online projects. And during When COVID came, we started an online masjid. I mean, uh, a play. It's, we call it the Rabota Masjid. It's certainly not. I don't follow the opinion that you can pray behind someone via internet. Right, so right. we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have other, we have gatherings of talks mm -hmm. and worship together. Medical, the jets, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it's grown into a really beautiful thing that I'm hoping to continue to grow for the next generation of women because I really want to see Muslim women continue to contribute to our society, our communities. Research tells us that it's women who carry forth culture, and yeah. especially research in religious studies. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that as a Muslim community, we don't leave our women behind right. or shunt them off mm -hmm. somewhere else or just make them feel like their opinion isn't important. Mm -hmm. And right. so, yeah, that's Rabota. Rabota means, of course, it's a root word. I know that you speak Arabic. So people who speak Arabic are like, why did you call it this really weird name? But it's Rabota as a root word. My original plan was to have every project be a derivative of Rabota. I was going to have Ribat, Rabita, Rabata, Murabit. Like I had this whole thing, you know. But after the first project, which was Ribat, one of my board members who's, who didn't speak much Arabic, some only, she said, you know, if we call it, if we do this, if everything is a derivative of Rabata, non-Arabic speakers are not going to have a clue the difference between them. Mm -hmm. So our next project was Daybreak Press. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but I, I think there's a Rabata is really, um, or even if it's Ribat or something like that, that I do think it is an appropriate name for such an organization because, I mean, when you think about the idea of doing a Ribat, you know, the Ribat, people don't realize that, you know, I think quite often is that that Ribat is like border control. Ribat is, you know, protecting the inroads, you know, yeah. to Khorzi, they protect it from the enemy, you know. So the enemy, if, again, the, the women are the, the main target, right? You know, the enemy. Oh, right? yes. Right. The cultural wars. I mean, where are the cultural wars landing? They're landing at our doorstep. They're landing at our feet. They're landing with our children. They're landing in school. Mm -hmm. And so this concept of positive cultural change mm -hmm. is to, we want to be ready to be for that. I mean, the cultural wars are going to happen mm -hmm. and what the purpose of them is going to change. Mm -hmm. But we want to be ready with our culture mm -hmm. to be strong in our culture yeah. so that we're not swayed right and left mm -hmm. ourselves and our, and our children, our families. Right. So yeah, it's really critical. And yes. And Robota also, you can say that means to bring together, to tie right. together. Right. So, right. And it's a verb. I like the verb thing because yeah. I'm all about action. <laughs> yeah, <Michelle. laughs> yes. So on average, what's the, uh, the, the, the normal class size for one like lesson or lecture that you give? Yeah. So our online classes that are the level one classes go up to my classes. The average is probably a hundred students. Okay. That's great. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's not, we have once in a while uh, smaller classes for the upper levels because they need more. I mean, that's when we're doing a different type of work, isn't mm -hmm. it? But those level one classes are around 100. Mm -hmm. The higher, high, we've had higher, but we don't like it to get too big because it's not about mass teaching as much as it is about mm -hmm. merely also creating a space where women can interact about their learning. Right. Well, I'm, another, another question I think is um, an important one to ask too is, um, in light of the fact that you've been focusing only on women, um, have you experienced and or continue to experience some resistance to that? Because naturally, we know uh, once, um, of course, a lot of brothers in the community were uncomfortable with that. It's not something that people are accustomed to seeing. And, you know, it's like, well, you have this this woman. She went she studied many years in Syria, mashallah, a legitimate scholar. And now she comes home and we know her background in feminism. Right. And, you oh, know, seriously. you're right. And so it's right. So it's like now she folks it. Why is she focus it only on women? Right. You know, so what is he what is he trying to do? Right. And so, I mean, how would you respond to someone who would even um, bring something up like that? Right. I don't usually get that response. OK, but, um, okay great. Yeah. but I but when I do, yeah. I mean, and I think that you know, I've been very honest about my background in feminism mm -hmm. and yeah. it has influenced me, but it hasn't influenced me in this sort of bitterness yeah. that mm -hmm. people talk about. Right. It's influenced me in my, as I said, it helped my journey, helped my ability to see how, the role of women in Islam, that Islam has a place for women. What a blessing. Right. And I think mm -hmm. that the whole by women, for women thing is a very important thing in our faith. We have to be able to grow. Mm -hmm. I think what I would say to someone who said that to me is mm -hmm. that I, I don't have any I don't have any doors that are closed, you know, any anything except for this space where women can share and talk and mm -hmm. grow together. The usual complaint I get actually is that's not fair. We want to attend your classes. That's ah, the okay. usual one I get. Right. And for that, I say there are a lot of other options out there, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I'm that women have been blocked from for years mm -hmm. or even if not blocked, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been the the opportunity. You know, I had mm -hmm. a group from Texas tell me. Mm -hmm. Come and come to me and say, we have so many scholars down here, mashallah, mm -hmm. but and they're and and they're great and they're, you know, alhamdulillah for this. But we don't know what to do because they give a talk and then the brothers get to go and hang out with them, play basketball, and we can't and we feel left out. Mm -hmm. And so I I would like to provide that for women that mm -hmm. they can maybe I'm not gonna play basketball with them, but we can <laughs> we can do the other you know the things that. Mm -hmm. that maybe they'll like to do. I'm, I'm sure lots of women like to play basketball. It's just not my thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just like the hangout. Is they're talk, not talking about the basketball anyway. They're talking about hanging out. Right. They're talking about mm -hmm. the learning that happens between the lessons. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important thing for women to have an opportunity to achieve. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important. Now, right. I do teach at the Islamic Seminary of America. And mm -hmm. when men come and tell me you don't teach, for, I say, well, if you really are desperate, you can go sign up over there. But mm -hmm. otherwise, everything else that I do is uh, by women, for women, for the most part, 80, 90 percent. Alhamdulillah. I mean, that's great to hear. Great to hear. You know, and, and I and I definitely want to also just, uh, just acknowledge that um, I've known, you know, from my interaction with you, you know, over the years is that, you know, that when it comes to your past with respect to feminism, that I had never detected any type of bitterness from you, you know, it's just, okay, well, I know this is something I know, right, you know, and, right. you know, and so definitely they did have its influence, but but I'd never detected since you as being an individual who was uptight about men, right? And was, right, and right. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh, that's right. I mean, this would be, this yeah. would be, um, no, I, I was a I think though that I, I do bring, if I'm honest about it, I do bring a a demand sort of for Muslim men to stand up and be Muslim men and yeah. not to sort of hide behind mm -hmm. verses or hide their own <laughs> issues behind verses of the Quran or verses of the Prophet. Just look at the whole picture of who the Prophet was, mm -hmm. who were the early men. Mm -hmm. And and I and I say the same to women. Mm -hmm. That we also need to, and we do. We used to do. We do still this mm -hmm. award that we see. We are Khadija, mm -hmm. and we are with others. We are Nusayba, others. Mm -hmm. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala with them. And one of the things I was trying to do with that is that we are, as an Ummah, as women, it's easy for us to say, "Yes, I want to be like Abu Bakr." 
Mm-hmm. But men, as far as I know, and I don't know, maybe you'll correct me, mm-hmm. as far as I know, are not always looking at people like Khadija radiallahu anha or Nusayba radiallahu anha or uh, Ashifa mm-hmm. or Muraqa or these women mm-hmm. and saying, oh, I could be like her in this way too. Right. Right. And I think it's important for us to recognize that all of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi are important for our lives mm-hmm. to learn from. We need to look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through the eyes of those who loved him most and those of the men and women who were around him. Right. And so maybe that's where my influence comes, just to remember the women, my right. past thinking around that, yeah. Right, so it's beautiful, beautiful. I mean, there, there are so many women, of course, you know, who have been important in pillars of uh, Islam for, for, for many, many centuries. Um, great are great many scholars who we often acknowledge the male scholars even who had you know you know female teachers um, and one important personality that you wanted to focus on today was um, Nana Esma'u um, you know so why don't you tell us a little bit about who she was when she lived and why you consider her to be an important uh, personality uh, who more Muslims need to know more about well, I just love this opportunity to talk about her because she is so awesome. And I'm all about education. I mean, I'm the kind of person who 30 years ago sat down and thought about my life mission and how education is going to be, how education is the key to, to make the types of changes that need to be made, etc. So Nana Asma'u is she's an amazing person. She didn't live that long ago. And that's the thing. She was born in 1793. So think about that. I mean, that's not that long ago, 1793. Right. And she was born in the Sokoto Khalifa. Mm-hmm. Her father was called the Sheikh Osman Dan Fodio. There are some people who say that her father was a Mujaddid. Mm-hmm. And there, during her lifetime, there was a letter that was written to her by another scholar that spoke to her as though he believed she was the Mujaddida. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by her life because she was a great, great scholar, but it wasn't just scholarship. She was also what we call today sort of a practical, she was very practical in her application of her scholarship and concerned about the ummah and the future of the ummah. And so, for example, in, in the mid 1800s, um, there was a, a war. And after the war, there was all of this area of, Sokoto Khalifa, okay? And in that area, she was very concerned about the women mm-hmm. because there was a mass conversion. A lot of people came to Islam, but she said, how are the women who are Muslims now going to teach their children about Islam? How are we holding Islam in this space? People became Muslim, alhamdulillah. What's next? And it was really difficult because there were little villages all over the place. And so, and how do you get there? How do you tackle issues of literacy? How do you tackle issues of language, the Arabic language? How do you tackle issues of all this knowledge? I, I know that you've experienced trying to help one convert mm-hmm. learn how to pray, learn how to follow this. How do you do that with thousands yes. of people? And so she devised a plan that is just creative education. I, a lot of what I do is modeled after uh, what I see in her. Mm. And this creative idea where she got, she took her students and she would pair them up. A young uh, woman, in our age, we would call her a young child, 13, 14 years old. But for Nana Asma, she was a young woman mm-hmm. and an older woman, uh, post childbearing years, over 40. Mm-hmm. So these two, they, they would be the teachers. And she wrote an entire curriculum in verse so they could memorize it gave it to these women. And then during the dry season, they would travel to these villages. And there were a number of these teams. They would travel to the villages. They would stay there, teach, 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 and then come back. Sometimes bringing back with them uh, new students who would then become the new teachers later. Sometimes bringing back with them other uh, questions that they would bring back. But she held Islam to that region because of this System, this incredible system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And something really fascinating to me is that the Sokoto Khalifa did not fall to colonial rule until 1903. Mm. And personally, I believe that it has something to do with the deep roots of Islamic scholarship amongst women that was in that area Mm -hmm. that that protected them from 
the colonialism that was yeah. all over Africa yeah. during that time. Yeah. Now, yeah, I said her, her father, Shiro Osman, he emphasized the importance of female education. Yeah. Right. And so very yeah. much, very yeah. much. And he also was really, um, he really saw in Nana Asma'u a future, even when she was born. I mean, he was definitely, Allahu Alam, but it mm -hmm. seems from what we read that he was of the awliya, of the mm -hmm. people of God. When, his, when Nana Asma'u was born, when her name was, Nana was in her title. And when she was born, she was a twin. Mm -hmm. And I think she was uh, 22 and 23, she and her brother. Uh -huh. And normally they would have named, the, the brother was Hassan, so they would have named her Hassana, Hassana too. Uh -huh. <laughs> but he felt that she had a great future. And so he named her Asma. Mm. So it was unusual that she had a special name, unlike her brother. Right. And she was, she was born in 1793. She was married in 1807. She had her first child in 1813. Mm -hmm. And she begins, before that, she begins to be the scribe of her father. Mm -hmm. And so she has this incredible education. All of the girls, and bo of course the boys, but also all of the girls in the household of Osman Zanfodio, my eldest mm -hmm. family, please with him. Uh, received this educate this incredible education, and she did have sisters who also were very bright, but she shined above all of them. And she even like later on, she'll be her father will ask her advice about things. Her father will ask her for help with something. Her mm -hmm. she started to write in 1820 herself. So uh, in 1820, how old would she be? 27 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, she would have she started to write. She wrote her first long written work uh, and continued then to write and then build this incredible curriculum. And mm -hmm. she was also, you know, I studied leadership for my doctorate. And one of the things that we talked about is symbolic leadership and understanding what is the role of how we present ourselves to the yeah. world. Mm -hmm. And so when she was sending these women to these villages, she thought about that symbolic leadership. The... Mm -hmm. There was at that time, previous to Islam, there was a woman called the Jaji who would go from village to village as a something like a medicine woman or something like that. Okay, mm -hmm. animist religions, not a Muslim. But she had like a special hat she would wear, like a straw hat. And so what she did is to help the villages accept these teachers that were coming is that she gave them a straw hat to put on top of their mm -hmm. hijab with a ribbon around it. So it was also a little bit different. So, so you know, you're, you're something, and then they, she called them jaji. So they mm -hmm. were called the jajis mm -hmm. of this area. Mm -hmm. And I'm just blown away by her brilliance to think of that so that mm -hmm. when they would walk into the area immediately, there was this feeling of, oh, you are women of knowledge. You. Right. People who can come and help us, we can learn from you. Mm -hmm. I just, as you can tell, I'm very excited <laughs> about Nana Asma'u. MashaAllah, may Allah be pleased with her. I mean, I mean, I mean. Yeah, and it seemed like she was pretty, actually pivotal during her brother's reign, yeah, Muhammad Bello, uh, who was the um, successor to Usman Danfodi. Yeah. And so it seemed like he really relied upon her and her counsel quite a bit, right? So, yeah. so definitely someone. Um, there's also a story of a karama. I don't know if you'd like no. to think about this. Yeah, no, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, there's a story where uh, when her brother was leading an army, mm -hmm. her father was still alive, and her mm -hmm. father rushed to her mm -hmm. and said, your brother, your brother, your mm -hmm. brother needs mm -hmm. help, something like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she picked, uh, there was a fire in front of her. She picked a burning ember from the fire and said, burn all the land that they were fighting in. Mm -hmm. And when they came back, he said that they were about to be destroyed and a fire came up and separated them oh. from the army that was about to destroy them. Mm -hmm. And so they attributed this to Nana Asma'u's uh, karama or dua, uh, that or answered dua, either way you want to look at it, of uh, protecting her brother. Yeah, subhanAllah. Yeah, well, so, so Sheikh Ibrahim Laqani, you know, that we believe in the karama, it's an awliya, we do, right? And so, yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's, I love that story. And I think it's, it also, I love the, I just love this whole family and how they work together and how she thought about, one of the, her, the lists of her writing that we have still is the poems that she wrote about the teacher she sent out. Mm -hmm. 
so her her memory of them, her appreciation of them, there's a lot to learn from her in the world of leadership. There's a lot to learn from her in the world of education, in the world of feeling uh, solid in your knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, Adab as well. She had great Adab. And you read the letters that she wrote to the scholars of the region. The letters they wrote to her and the letters she wrote back. Mm -hmm. The language of Adab that we've all lost, you know. The yeah. long introductions and the long closings. Yeah, yeah. yeah now I'm going to come back to you just for a, a second. Um, now, do you have any writings of your own? Yes, I wrote. Um, so the first thing I wrote and published as a book was is Joy Jots. And it's called Joy Jots. Yay. Uh, it's called 52 Exercises for a Healthy Heart. And mm -hmm. it was written in my year of grief. Oh, okay. And the year that I came back and uh, was just struggling. And I wrote it originally not realizing that I was writing it during my year of grief. Like I was writing this Dominic. And I didn't figure that out until a high school friend of mine, she came to see me and she said, I want to buy your book. You know, the one you wrote about grief. And I said, I'm um, sorry. I wrote a book about joy. You know, mashallah. I'm right, right, right. Right. Yeah. And she said, oh, I don't know why. And I thought, after, I went home that night and I thought, yeah, Allah, subhanAllah. She's right. Mm -hmm. It's not about grief. Right. But it's about how do we find oh, joy sorry. in the midst of grief through mm -hmm. our faith. Mm -hmm. And so it's 52 different essays and I'm alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. It was very helpful to me actually uh, during that year. And I'm, so yes, I wrote that. And then I also wrote in collaboration with a student of mine, a book called Project Lina, Bringing Our Whole Selves to Islam. Mm -hmm. And this is a book for convert with some women. Like it's a really niche book, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's there because I've met so many convert women. It's getting better, alhamdulillah, but so many convert women throughout the years who really struggle to hold on to their culture, who struggle to understand what is how what of my culture can I bring forth? How do I become a Muslim fully and not have different parts of me that are not, that are you know, the whole split name thing for years when Muslims mm -hmm. would come to a new convert and say, okay, now your name is Khadija and she would still be Carol. So she would be Khadija with these people and Carol with these people. Mm -hmm. well, how do you bring all of that together? Right. So that book is written for for that issue, but it has other, a lot of other things in it too, tips mm -hmm. and help. It has, has some aqidah in there, some basic aqidah so that mm -hmm. converts can like get caught up, you know, like let's uh, catch up and be feel mm -hmm. confident in their faith because they became Muslim as confident people and then mm -hmm. they kind of dwindle somehow, feeling concerned, worried about their, their um, knowledge, I guess, really. So, mm -hmm. and then I worked as a, on a translation of a book with my, uh, with and Serenda Mardini and say Sosan Aymadi. Sosan Aymadi is my sister-in-law, God bless her. And we worked on the translation of Jamma Fisir and Nabawiyyeh, Mukhtasar Jamma Fisir and Nabawiyyeh, which is the um, compendium of the prophetic narrative written by uh, Samir Zayed. And that was a labor of love to be sure. That wasn't a book that I authored, of course. It was part of, I was part of the translation team, but it was it, really the, the work of translation, I find it a deepening of Adam. So even though I had yeah. studied you know, yeah, for totally. so many years, I changed my connection to every incident, every everything. Subhanallah. Right, right, I'm right. Uh, I I'm working now. I've worked with some articles and things like that. I'm working right now on an Aqidah book. Mm -hmm. oh, really? Okay. Um, textbook. My the concept there is a textbook for our program, and then for anybody else who needs it. Every time I try to get an Aqidah book to teach from, I don't find one that is fitting my needs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that this will get done, right? I mean, that's the first thing I hope, that it will get right. done. Right. And right. then I hope for Qubul, that it will be something that's really right. useful right. to students uh, mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. I have a number of projects, actually. I really, mm -hmm. uh, writing is something that I I enjoy and mm -hmm. I I have a system, but I, so mm -hmm. I like to do it, but um, yeah. that's the end. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I'm actually trying to work out my schedule so that I can do more of it. I, mm -hmm. I think it's important to, yeah, but you're doing so much. You got <laughs> I look at your bio and everything you're involved in. Your, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to put blessing in your barakah in your time. Uh, you know, so, so your books, you know, they're available through your website or Amazon or some other uh, outlet. Or... All of those, except for the compendium. The translation is only available through us right now, as far as I know, um, just because of the printing issues. The original print is complete. And so now the, the second print, which is not, it's just a print. It's not a different edition. 
is um, only available through us here. And then uh, there will be another, a new edition coming out maybe next year. So. Sure. Well, okay. So you, could you mention like your website address and any other uh, ways that people can follow your work? Yes. Uh, our web website is rabata.org, R-A-B-A-T-A.org. From there, you can find our learning management systems for Ribat, our online educational programming. You can find our bookshop.rabata.org there as well, which is where you find not only our published books, but also a curated collection of books that teach uh, both you know, books from Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah that we try to really choose the beautiful books, but also we have books that are important for Muslim women, some of them being around how to run a nonprofit, how to manage your time and things like that. And a, a large collection of children's books as well. And uh, all of that at rabata.org. And I'm on all the things. I'm on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I'm on, I'm not so, you know, I was on Twitter. I really liked Twitter. And then it became X. And I'm just like, what in the world? Like, I don't know. Like, I'm a word person more than a picture person. So I really enjoyed Twitter. And I'm just kind of like, I don't know. Are you working? Are you on X? Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually, yeah. I, I still call it Twitter most of the time. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm still, I'm actually more active on X than I'm on Facebook and other, other places. Yeah, that's, how, be, that's what I used to be yeah, because I yeah. enjoyed it. And I'm just feeling yeah. stuck. So yeah. I, maybe I'll just get back on if that's if you yeah. Just, just, yeah I think yeah for me it was different because like I was being censored on Facebook and Instagram for certain things they posted they didn't like mm -hmm. so but but with when Elon took over it he, you know it made it easier for me so I, I wouldn't be sort of uh I'm not being censored at the moment so I I just say okay I'll I'll just use that mainly yeah for, gotcha for well I like and then there's threads are you using threads no I'm, I've heard about that I haven't you know really had a look at it yet. It's really it's Twitter on uh, it's, okay. it's, it's feathery Twitter. Okay, right, right. Yeah, that was sort of like the offshoot. You know, people got upset with Elon, and then they decided they started thread. Okay, that's right. Yeah, I remember hearing about that. Yeah, yeah, it's like I've a softer been, Twitter. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, again, I haven't. I've been kind of yeah. sort of. I don't know, but I am in all of those places at Tamra. Yeah, yeah. That's where Inshallah. you can find me. All yeah. those. Places. Okay, okay, yeah. alhamdulillah. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, any any closing um, words of advice or counsel for the community? Uh, before we, uh... I think it's really, I guess, um, I always have so much to say. Uh, I think it's really important that we always remember that wherever we are and whatever's happening in the world, that we have to stay focused and not, mm -hmm. and not fall into any tricks of shaitan to distract us from the focused goal. We have things we have to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us on this earth. This is the only time we have to get good deeds, to to help others, to focus outside of us. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about the Muslim communities picking up of sort of the global, selfish, it's all about me yeah. uh, mm -hmm. way of living. And it's it's a frightening thing, really, because we the, the path will be short. We want to have the whole path, the, the, the length of the path. And so, yeah, I really hope that everyone can keep in mind the long-term goal, akhirah, the and the tools and get the tools that you need, get the help from people that you need. But really, we all need to keep growing. We need to grow into Ahsan. This is where we, what we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be the people that the world is benefiting from. That's right. We should be a benefit to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we need to pull and push and drag ourselves as an ummah together to mm -hmm. be in that place where the world will be benefiting from us and we will mm -hmm. be offering them the khair and goodness that we have. To offer right, yeah, right. I mean, I mean, oh, beautiful. Dr. Tamara Gray, really appreciate you taking your time out for this today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless you. And hopefully it won't be the last time. Thank you so much. It was fun. Hopefully you enjoyed that episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel here on YouTube and Spotify. Looking forward to seeing you in the next episode. God willing. Peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.